Welcome to Get Paid for Your Pad, the definitive show on Airbnb hosting, featuring the best advice on how to maximize profits from your Airbnb listing, as well as real life experiences from Airbnb hosts all over the world. Welcome. Get paid for your pad. 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 This episode is brought to you by Hostfully, a company that helps you make beautiful guidebooks for your listing. Make your own at hostfully.com slash pad. And as a special for Get Paid for Your Pad listeners, you'll get a free guidebook consultation after you make your guidebook. Episode 206. Today I have a repeat guest on the show. And if you've been listening to Get Paid for Your Pad for about three and a half years, then you might actually remember him because in 2014, July 31st, I interviewed Vincenzo Villamina, also known as the online text man. And Vincenzo, that's a while ago, man. That was episode it's, number eight. It's been a long time, man. You've come a long way since then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, sure. man. It feels like eternity. Yeah, um, this is like, you know, a retro, you know, kind of going back in time, man. Because I do remember that episode. I mean, I remember obviously, you know, coming on and helping you out. So it's cool to see you uh, proceed this far. Yeah, absolutely. And you've done a lot of things since then as well. I mean, back in the day, I interviewed you to give advice to Airbnb hosts when it comes to taxes, because you specialize in tax advice for, especially for digital nomads and expats. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. Yeah, totally right. But just to uh, give a little background, like me and Vicenzo have been good friends for quite a long time. I, we go back maybe 2010, 2011 or so, I'd say. And we've been around, yeah. man. Like we've been to some places together, huh? I was just thinking about it. Yeah. We've been to Brazil a lot. I remember Florianopolis, Belo Horizonte, Colombia. I think we spent some time in Bali as well. We did Bali. I think we met out in Sweden when our mutual friend was living out there and, you know, that whole uh, Stockholm spec in and everything. Right. Oh, yeah, that's right. I almost forgot about that. Yeah, don't forget about that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, man, we, we've done Hong Kong, I think. Yeah, we've been around. Yeah, we've definitely been around the globe a couple of times, meeting up in yeah. different places. And, you know, we're, our awesome. lifestyles are pretty similar. Like Vincenzo also is a, would you describe yourself as a digital nomad? I would say I'm a digital nomad, but I, I keep my bases. Do you know what I mean? Kind of like how you've been, you know, a little bit based in Taipei and here and there. But I, I would say my base is now it's Medellin. I was in Buenos Aires for a while, so. But I, I like to do my sort of nomadic things, especially in the off season. Right, and I guess a lot of your clients are from the U.S. So is that the reason why you're kind of sticking to that time zone? Yeah, I mean, I think between that and just kind of finding my groove in South America, man, to me, South America kind of checks all the boxes. And obviously, kind of the familiarity with Spanish and Portuguese also helps that. Right. Got it. Yeah. Well, time zone wise, it's definitely a bit of a challenge sometimes to be here in Asia. I mean, right now it's almost midnight. <laughs> yeah. This is typically, this is a very usual time for me to either do a podcast recording or have calls with partners, or it's either like really early in the morning, like 7 a.m. or it's like 11 p.m. You know, it's like, yeah, man, no, totally. It's like, yeah, that's tough being out in Asia, honestly. But there's a lot of good things about Asia as well, so I'm very happy to be here. But let's talk about what you've been up to in the recent years, because the reason that I asked you to come back on this podcast is actually because you're going to be one of the people that I wanted to feature in my new book, which is all about Airbnb investing. And you've mm -hmm. invested in a couple of properties in Medellin, in Colombia. And so yep. we're going to talk all about your experiences and there are some challenges, there are some ups and downs and stuff. So I'd say let's get into it. Do you mind describing the two properties that you've invested in? Sure. Yeah, I mean, so basically I've been living in Medellin for, for a few years now and, and obviously, you know, really also part of your inspiration and just kind of like, you know, wanting to do stuff with my money. I invested in, in two apartments, two very different apartments actually too. I mean, first off, both... Both are located in Poblado, which is essentially the best 
you know, neighborhood, if you will. And, and obviously a lot of foreigners, digital nomads, when they go there, they kind of hear about it and, and end up staying there. But one property is a three bedroom. And, you know, part of the reason why I did the three bedroom was you now I was able to find it. And I also remember just kind of asking around and asking, you know, the real estate agents, you know, hey, like what's the, the most rentable place? And a lot of them came back and said, listen, three bedrooms, they're not easy to find. You know, as you have like a group of friends, a group of nomads coming down together or uh, even a family for that matter or someone that, I don't know, a couple or, or some people that might have some friends coming throughout their stay, the three bedroom kind of people indicated was in short supply. So I was able to get a three bedroom in Poblado. That was my first purchase. And in fact, I didn't even use my personal money. I used money from an IRA in the United States using something called self-directed IRA, which we could get into. But I used that IRA, that retirement money, and I was able to buy that property, that first three bedroom. And I bought it for around 90,000 US dollars. And then I put around 10K of work into it. And that's mostly just redoing the kitchen, the bathrooms and, and kind of painting and just some small stuff to kind of modernize it. So yeah, that's worked out really well. Then, you know, as I was still kind of looking around for another place, this other place fell on me that it's a studio apartment. It's about 40 square meters, so like 90 uh, square feet. You know, again, also in Boblado in a really, really good area, just kind of like a small tree-lined street. It's super quiet, yet close enough to the action, so to speak. So really, really uh, well located. However, this one I got for really, really cheap. And so I didn't put a lot of work into it. I mean, I made sure, listen, it's super livable. It's really, really nicely furnished, but it's not something like I, you know, redid the whole bathroom, right? I mean, the bathroom's pretty good. In fact, I made sure I put in a whole new shower, et cetera, because I remember when I went to see it, I there was actually an Airbnb tenant in there. And I remember asking him, hey, you know, what's the deal with the place? You know, how is it? And he's like, hey, the place is good. There's no hot water. I was like, okay, fine. When I bought the place, I remember making sure I do the hot water, making sure I, I did some small renovations, but I literally bought that place for around like 45000 50000 or something and put maybe like a 1000 of renovations into it. And again, just to do the bare minimums to make it nice. And I rent that one out too, right? And I mean, again, with the studio, it's a little bit of a different thesis. I, I kind of lowball it a little bit, but you know, there's a lot of people that come to Medellin you know, on their own, kind of checking it out, or even maybe want to just test out lifestyle for a couple of weeks. There's also a lot of kind of retirees on a, you know, social security or pension. So I kind of know that they're on a budget so that they kind of go for these sort of low, low cost places that they're kind of on their own. Both places equally worked out like equally as well. I mean, I'm both getting over 10% return on them, but two very different, I guess you could say, you know, investment hypothesis that, that worked out. Awesome. So let's get into those hypotheses. Let's start with the free bedroom, because I know there's some limitations with regard to short-term rental in Colombia and Medellin as well. Yeah. Let's talk about that first. Like, how do you rent it out? Like, is it possible to rent out the free bedroom for less than 30 days? Yeah. So, I mean, the thing about Medellin is that you're right. There is this sort of 30-day, month-to-month rental law, right? Which means, yeah, basically you can't rent out short term for under 30 days unless the building has a hotel license. And there's some buildings that do, and there's even kind of a local gringo developer that that's exactly what he does. He gets investments for that. But generally, no. I mean, you could maybe push it. It's kind of like, depends if it's enforceable by the building. For the three bedroom, I won't say it's enforceable, but listen, there's doormen, you know, there, there's nosy neighbors, etc. So I kind of keep it you know, in that 30 day window. I mean, I'm not going to say maybe I've rented it out for like 25 days or whatnot. Like, it's not like they really care if it's a little bit under, but you kind of have to be aware of that. And also, you know, when you got a three bedroom and you got, let's say, potentially like three guys living together, there's just a little bit of a recipe for disaster there when it comes to people coming to Medellin to party. You know, there's a little bit of a party scene there and you know, there's a lot of serious people, but there's certainly also a lot of people that are just there to party. So it's another reason why I kind of try and maintain that 30-day rule for people. 
That makes sense. And I actually, once you started talking about three guys living together in Poblado in a three bedroom apartment, I suddenly realized back in 2014, January 2014, it was actually you, me, and one of your friends living together when I wrote my book, Get Paid for Your Bet. Yeah. 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 It's true. I I totally remember you started the book. Yeah. I totally remember you sitting. We were the opposite of that. Although we did have our fair share partying, right? But I was doing some taxes. We were writing a book. So we weren't like super crazy, but you know, we got a little wild. Yeah, absolutely. We didn't party that much. I remember getting up at 7 a.m. pretty much every morning, but then I had a French friend visiting. I don't know if you remember yes. that. And he kind of wanted to party, you know? And then yeah, uh, I, so remember. We, I remember we went out a couple nights, but you know, we kept it pretty. Uh, kept it clean. Yeah, he kept it pretty uh, clean. No, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it could go either way, right? And I'm sure you know about this. It's, it's all about kind of screening your guests because there's a lot of people that go to Medellin straight for work, right? I mean, you know, Medellin kind of has a low cost of living and and could be really good for people to just kind of buckle down and focus like like we did that time. But, you know, the other side of it is that people go to Medellin for the partying and, you know, I hate to say it, but like the drugs and the girls. So sometimes you got to screen, especially in a place like that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know all about that, having hosted in Amsterdam for five years. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you know all about it. Sure. All right. So you're renting out the free bedroom on Airbnb, but you're doing, you know, you're trying to keep it to around like 30 days or so. Is there a lot of demand for that type of stays on Airbnb? Yeah. I mean, the thing about Medellin is there is a lot of demand for that because there's a lot of people that come down for you know, for a couple months, right? You have like kind of the snowbirds, meaning, you know, the people that want to get away from the winter in the U.S. that go down. You got people that want to just, I don't know, spend the summer in the U.S. Like people that live in Miami, for example, where, where it gets so hot, they want to come down for a few months. The three bedroom I've got quite a few bit of families, even like Colombian families that like they live in the United States, but they want to come down for the month to visit the grandma and the aunts and the cousins, etc. So I've got actually... It's kind of been across the board, but I mean, it's certainly been a place that, yeah, I mean, obviously people want to go down for like a weekend, but there's definitely a higher demand or there is a high demand for people that, that'll stay for for at least a month or, or a few months. And I think the other thing about it is, you know, Medellin, they call it the city of eternal spring. It's always spring, right? Meaning that like, it's not seasonal like other cities. And that's part of the reason why I kind of chose Medellin in the first place. And even, you know, I'm looking at, Portugal now potentially because I mean even though there is a winter like it's a short winter and and so I think seasonality at least in my when I was betting an investment you know I'm looking at Orlando too when there's less seasons you know obviously it means there's higher demand throughout the year and a higher occupancy rate. Absolutely, I think Portugal could be an interesting location. I actually have a friend who recently bought a place there, and he actually managed to get a mortgage on the ground, yep. which is interesting because that's kind of tough to get usually in a foreign country, right? Yes, that's the one thing. In Medellin, you really can't get a mortgage. I mean, you can, but it's going to be like 18% annually and it's just going to cut into any sort of profit. So yeah, so you really are buying all cash in Medellin. Right. And maybe you can explain a little bit about the construction that you have with that RRA money. All right. So basically, and this is a reason why I use the IRA, is to pay off cash, right? But basically, as an American... I mean, this is really only for Americans. There might be other options for people in other countries, but obviously, you know, I'm a U.S. expert and U.S. guy. But, you know, somebody can roll over their 401k, right, or their IRA into something known as a self-directed IRA, right? And what that means is, listen, I wasn't too confident in the public markets. You know, I felt more confident in my ability to find and rent a place on Airbnb in Medellin than investing it in the public markets and public companies run by people I don't know that I don't have the confidence in that what they're doing, right? So point is, is that I rolled over the money from my IRA into a self-directed IRA. Now, self-directed IRA means that that could be your personal investment vehicle. So literally what it is is an LLC that you can use to make investments in. You can't take the money out of the LLC, right? I mean, it has to stay within the LLC. If you take it out, it's a distribution and your tax on it. But if you use that LLC to buy a rental property or invest in a, you know, even a venture capital deal or or a startup that a friend's running or any other sort of, you know, again, private equity or whatever deal, 
you can do that, right? So you can invest in real estate. So what I did was I I used this LLC, this self-directed IRA LLC, to purchase the property in Colombia. The reason I did that was also because if I were to purchase a property in the United States and I were to get a mortgage, then the part of the investment that was leveraged that, that had the mortgage would be taxable, right? So there's another kind of funky rule where if you use the IRA but you use a mortgage, then then the part of the, the investment that's mortgaged is taxable. So it's really good for buying real estate with cash and knowing that, okay, I'm not going to be able to get a mortgage anyway, and I have this IRA money in the US, I use this self-directed IRA to buy my first apartment in Colombia. Awesome. So basically that those apartments are, that's your retirement. Yeah, exactly. So it's in my retirement funds. Because of that, there are some rules about like self-dealing, meaning, you know, I'm not allowed to live in that apartment. If someone were to stay in an apartment for a few nights, I'm sure the IRS wouldn't find out about it. But, you know, technically you can't live in the apartment, et cetera. But like I said, it's, it's basically retirement money. So all the money, all the rental income from the apartment goes into the IRA. I can't touch the rental income which I'm fine with, obviously, and then paying the expenses out of the IRA, et cetera. But yeah, I mean, when I sell this apartment, then of course it won't be taxed in the United States. And there could be a potential capital gains tax in Colombia, which I'll have to eat, but that's fine. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's essentially how it works. Okay. So it's also a way for you to avoid the capital gains tax in the US. Correct. Exactly. All right. Interesting. Host, I can't emphasize how important it is to share recommendations of things to do or eat near your listing beforehand. Your guests won't have to go through TripAdvisor, Foursquare or Yelp. They won't have to scratch their head and think about possible places right in the moment. I've been using Hostfully to create an online and printable guidebook to show my guests my favorite coffee places in Amsterdam. They use my recommendations and I'm getting fewer questions from my guests as a result. I've also included screenshots of my guidebook on my Airbnb listing as a way to differentiate my listing from others. So make your own guidebook at hostfully.com slash pad. Awesome. Well, let's talk about that studio that you got, because I know that that one, it's a bit easier to rent it out under 30 days, right? Yes. I mean, the studio, I do rent it out for under 30 days. And like I said, I mean, it's, this sort of rule is really kind of enforceable by the building. And so the studio is in a smaller building. Again, it's in a poblado, it's in a good area. You know, the doorman's not even always there. And even the doorman, he's kind of on the payroll a bit as far as helping me out with the check-ins and, and doing the cleanup. And so, you know, I rent it out for a few days or a week or whatever. And, and again, I mean, and actually it has a lot of short-term rentals because a lot of people, what I found is, you know, people also kind of come to Medellin for like two weeks for like learning Spanish. It's close to a bunch of Spanish schools. So yes, people kind of rent it out for a couple of weeks. But that one, because it's a small building, it's kind of under the radar. I've, I've been able to rent it out for under the 30-year day rule. And like I said, I mean, it, there hasn't been any problems. And, you know, just kind of the nature of the people that are renting by themselves, I don't really see them causing any sort of issues or wild parties, et cetera. Awesome. Now let's talk about some of the things that you need to keep in mind before you're investing in an Airbnb property. I've been talking to a lot of people, you know, for the research that I'm doing for my book. And one of the most important decisions that you have to make is obviously, you know, where are you going to invest? So can you talk about you know, how did you research Medellin as a potential location? What are the things that you looked at? I think the biggest thing for me is, you know, looking at kind of price to short-term rental, you know what I mean? What's kind of the ROI? And I mean, the thing about Medellin is, you know, they don't have like mortgages there, but you know what that means? That means that there's also not a lot of speculation. So there's not like people that are, you know, buying and reselling or, do you know what I mean? Because there's not like this sort of Colombian market where people are just kind of jacking up the price through all these mortgages. The appreciation on property uh, year after year is 7%, and that's a real appreciation. When there was like a housing bubble in the United States and, you know, there was all these speculators and kind of the price of housing went super sky because of the fact that people could just get mortgages and flip them in like a year. But Medellin you don't have that. But I think the biggest thing was going there year after year and, and seeing just all the gringos, all the digital nomads, all the people that are going there. You know, again, the same could be said about looking at a place in Portugal or, or, or even another area. 
I think for me, it was just kind of just the feeling of, okay, this place is blowing up and then really doing the research and seeing the returns, seeing what people are renting out to foreigners and the relative price of the apartments. Right. And, and you're very familiar with Medellin, right? You spent a lot of time there. I would say yeah. that's almost like a necessary condition, right? Before you invest in a property somewhere, you got to know the market. You got to be there on the ground to see what it's like and preferably spend a lot of time there. I know you've spent quite a lot of time in Medellin, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think part of it is I'm a fan of, you know, having a properties and places that you want to spend time in. Do you know what I mean? And so that you can even live there for part of the time and then obviously rent it out when you're gone. And, you know, obviously me and you both are kind of like nomadic people. So we see a lot of places. There's some places I like living, some places I just like visiting and spending a lot of time there and kind of knowing the market and, you know, what's a good deal, what's a whatever deal. And being patient was another part, right? I mean, I was I was hitting the ground trying to find these apartments. I mean, it wasn't like I just, they kind of fell on my lap. I mean, I've actively searched for them. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's really important because you look at the prices that you've paid and, you know, you've got some really great deals and that's just not possible if you're not spending a lot of time in the market, right? You can't just live somewhere in Europe or in the US and then just go on a two week trip to Medellin and, and find a place like you did. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, and what I was doing was I was just, well, there's a few things, right? One, there's no MLS, there's no multiple listing service in Medellin. So you could talk to as many brokers as you can. And, you know, they all have different stuff for you, right? So I was looking at the Colombian brokers. I was talking to the, the brokers targeting foreigners. And most importantly, and this is where I found my two apartments. I was talking to the doorman because the doorman know where the deals are. It's sort of like a secret cult of doormen. And they all kind of know each other. They know who just died in the building. They know who's getting divorced in the building, who just had a kid and needs to move into a bigger place. They know the scoop. And it was the doorman that ultimately I found those two apartments. You know what I mean? And I would ask every doorman, you know, I'd go and hang out with a buddy. And then on the way out from leaving his place, I'd say, oh, hey, is there a, you know, is there any apartments that are for sale here? It's about keeping your ear to the street. If you want to find the deal, you have to keep your ear to the street. So that's where it is, the secret sauce. It's a doorman. Yes, the doorman. Would you like take them out for drinks and stuff and get them drunk and get some information? Or It goes without saying that they're getting a little bit of a, not even a little tip, you know, a decent commission out of it. It's way cheaper than the real estate broker anyway. Even that was something that I used as a negotiation tactic when I was negotiating for these apartments saying, hey, listen, we don't have to pay a broker fee. Let's see what we can do with the price. Right. And can you talk a little bit more about the negotiation process? Yeah. So it's funny. You know, people in Medellin, Pisces as they're called, are always known for being very shrewd business people. They're also known for being very good negotiators. So it's kind of almost part of their culture to negotiate. And obviously that was a big part of the process. So when I found the two apartments, let's talk about the three bedroom. The three bedroom, I bought off this sort of couple. The guy was a little bit of a hard ass with negotiating, but he also knew that I was getting a really good deal. We actually did a little bit of a, a lease to buy sort of thing where I actually rented it out for a few months. And then I you know, applied some of that, that deposit and, and rent money to the purchase price. So the studio was a, a more pleasant negotiation. Again, we kind of went back and forth. Out of that one, I mean, I lowered the price, but I also, you know, got some of the stuff included that I knew I would need for the Airbnb, right? A smart TV, a washer dryer. I think he threw in a bunch of like the kitchen supplies and stuff. And, you know, again, we kind of were able to, to meet in the middle and, and whatnot on that. Awesome. So it sounds like, you know, the most important factors in your research was just know your market, spend a lot of time there, do the groundwork. And then, you know, negotiate in a smart way. And that's how you got the yeah. good deals. Yeah. I crunched all the numbers and you know, I factored in all the costs of, you know, taxes and, you know, admin and how much for, you know, for the furnishing. Oh, for example, another big thing in Medellin, no one likes to buy secondhand apartments or furnitures. I was able to get a ton of furniture super cheap on like OLX, which is like their version of Craigslist, you know, and like really nice stuff. You know, same thing with apartments. Everyone wants to have a new apartment there. All the locals do. So, you know, again, I was looking for these sort of 10 years, 15 years, 20 years old apartments that were pretty in good shape, but maybe need a little work. 
so that I could obviously just do some renovations and get a better deal. So I, don't, I mean, it's all about knowing the market. I mean, it's all about kind of picking people's brains, asking the right questions and talking to like not just one, two, but like three, four, five, six plus people who are in the industry and getting a feel for what's good, what's hot, what's a good area, what's, you know, et cetera. And I assume that speaking Spanish helped you a lot as well. Yeah. Speaking Spanish definitely helped. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't say it's a deal breaker for people. I mean, I know people that have gone in and, and done it without speaking Spanish, but of course that didn't hurt. Right. And so you mentioned before you're making about 10%. Is that after subtracting all the costs in the Texas? Yeah, that's after, after subtracting. That's net. Right. So that's a pretty good return. And it's interesting that the return in your free bedroom is about the same as the return in your studio, because obviously you're renting the free bedroom for longer periods and the studio you're renting for shorter periods. So but you're still seeing a similar return. The big reason for that is actually the three bedroom, I definitely get a higher occupancy on it. And like I said, the studio, I compete on price with that. So in the end, they kind of come out to be the same. That's correct. Awesome. Are there any other challenges or words of advice that you have for specifically American people who want to invest either in Colombia or South America or, or let's just say in a foreign country? I think the biggest thing is, yeah, obviously you know your market, but also make sure you don't get screwed. The fact of the matter is, is that in South America, it's a different playing field. You know, and, and sometimes people don't always play fair. You want to get a good lawyer. You want to get a good accountant in these countries to make sure that, you know, the transaction is being done correctly, the title search and et cetera, et cetera, is being done correctly because, you know, people could screw you and even the lawyer or the accountant. So obviously you get someone that's recommended. Listen, I mean, Colombia's done really well for me. And I know people that have done well in, in Airbnbs and Buenos Aires and other places. So there's certainly potential But I think just people have to be aware of these factors and just kind of make sure that they have, that they're working with the right service providers to ensure that everything goes smoothly. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I definitely know people who did get screwed. I can know one yeah. person in Colombia who bought a piece of land and then it turned out that some family owned it. You yeah. know, he had a piece of paper, but... The, fam the family, they were like, no, this is our land. And, you know, you should get off our land right now or, or we'll call the police. And so he yeah. went to, you know, he went to the court and stuff. But at the end of the day, like he's basically just lost all his money. And I know this happened to Brazil as well. You know, you yeah. have to look at the way that properties and ownership is registered because in some of these countries, it's very different from what we're used to in the US or in Europe, right? I mean, I know in Brazil, right. for example, when I was in Florianopolis earlier this year, I was doing some research. And well, first of all, every single Brazilian person that I knew that I uh, sort of shared that I was looking to buy something, every single person told me, listen, like, do not buy anything like before you let me know. Okay. Let me look at it. Let me talk to some lawyers and stuff because yeah. there's just, just a, a big risk because you can literally buy something. You can sign a contract. It all looks legal. The lawyer might not even know. You know, this is the dangerous part. Yeah. Even when you get a lawyer, that lawyer might not even be aware that there's somewhere out there, there's another title going around. The central registry for, you know, properties and, and land is not always waterproof. There's leaks and holes and there's weird constructions. Yeah. Like there's, I know in Florianopolis, there's something really weird where, where some of the people who've owned the land for like generations or something, I don't know exactly the details, but. I just know that there's a possibility that you buy something and you think it's yours, but then it turns out it's not. And you could literally lose all your money because there's people out there that are aware of these rules and they will try to sell you something and you think that you own it, but you don't. And then that person yeah. basically takes your money. I mean, I always say this to people and obviously I'm biased because I'm an accountant, but listen, it pays to get a good lawyer and accountant and even having a second opinion on that. You know, it's not going to be cheap when it comes to service providers. You know, exactly. because then they cut corners and they don't care as much either. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'd say spending a few thousand extra dollars on getting some good legal advice, getting the right people in your team is definitely worth it because, I mean, the risk is just so enormous. I mean, you could lose all your money basically, right? So I think yeah. that's fair enough. Last seven years traveling around the world, I've heard so many different stories of people, especially foreigners, they come in and they see the low 
prices of the real estate compared to where they come from and they get all excited mm -hmm. and then there's always somebody who will go along with your excitement and just say whatever right. you want to hear and then it's easy to fall into that trap sometimes common sense is useful too right if something seems too good to be true then it typically is too good to be true right yeah the locals know just as much as you do that it's a good deal that you know your dollars go far so just kind of don't be a fool right it was really interesting to talk to you. I'm sure we can talk for uh, a few hours, but yeah, totally. uh, feel free to let the listeners know if what kind of services you offer. This might be interesting. A lot of the people who are listening are from the US and a lot of them are traveling, I know. So tell us a little bit about what you do. I'm an expat accountant, basically. I have a firm, online tax man. You know, this is how it all comes full circle, right? Because when me and you met seven years ago, that was just when I, in Floripa, that was just when I started this company. And I remember you and you started your book and here we are kind of successful people. But yeah, I mean, I do taxes for Americans living abroad, Americans that live in the US but are investing abroad and need to be aware of all of the reporting requirements for owning foreign investments, owning foreign bank accounts, et cetera, et cetera, as well as actually foreigners that want to invest in the United States. Anyone has any questions? My website is uh, www.onlinetaxman.com. We do give a free consultation if anyone has any questions or wants to just kind of understand about our services. So, so feel free to reach out on the website and yeah, and we'll be in touch. Awesome, man. Great. Well, hopefully we will be able to spend some time together in the near future. I know you're in Buenos Aires right now. I'm probably going to yeah, come not... down to Colombia at some point because, as you know, I've also invested in a property there. I opted to go for Cali instead of Medellin. I felt like, you know, everyone's doing Medellin, so let me do something different. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how that pans out. It's being renovated right now. We'll, it'll be done sort of around the end of the year. So, yeah, hopefully we can connect. Yeah, man, that'd be great, man. I'll wait for you. Awesome, dude. Thanks a lot for coming on the show. And Thank you. For the second time, maybe in about three years or so, we can uh, have you back on like episode 568 or something like that. Yeah, and we'll have more Airbnb properties to talk about because, I mean, that's the one thing I'm not stopping with buying real estate, et cetera. So, yeah, we'll have more stories to share, et cetera. Hopefully all good. All right, man. Cool. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Right. And listeners... Right, Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Of course, Friday we'll be back with a news episode and next week we'll do another interview. So I hope to see you then. Bye-bye. Get paid for your pet. 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 Get paid for your pet.